This program is made possible by the Jim and Patty Rouse Charitable Foundation and the Maryland Humanities Council. Ethelbert Miller talks with Barbara Goldberg. Welcome to The Writing Life. My name is E. Ethelbert Miller. My guest today is Barbara Goldberg. Barbara Goldberg is a poet and translator. She's the author of two books that we have here today, Marvelous Pursuits and Cautionary Tales. Welcome to The Writing Life. Thank you. Let's begin with a poem from Marvelous Pursuits. I'll start with foreshadows, since this is about the writing life. Right. Foreshadows. Now that I've read the first draft of your body, I can already tell the rough places where there is need for further exploration. In due time, the clenched jaws will release a flurry of words, unearthing the grave heart from its vault of ribs. And since there already is perfection, the soft mounds of your fingers, the exquisite way they interpret my spine. Well then, I can wait for the rest, the story your tongue will tell to the flesh and its slow unfolding. Barbara Gober, you know, when I look at many of your poems and, and two of your collections, you write a lot about the body. Many, many of your poems are sensual or erotic. What about the politics of all of this? What about the politics of sex? What about the politics of language in terms of here you are a writer at this time in which when we pick up the newspapers, we see a lot of discussions about sex. Do poets approach this issue differently from other people? Well, yes, considering <laughs> that, that the, two, the two lives don't interface for me. When I'm talking about the body, I'm not talk, and I'm not even sure I'm talking about sex per se. I think when I'm talking about the body, I'm talking about knowing and how we know who we are in this world and what we're doing here. And it's, um, I think it's interesting that in the Hebrew Bible, mm -hmm. the word for knowing, you know, Adam knew Eve and all that, has the same double meaning as it does in English. In other words, to know, to understand, to be aware, and to know yourself, really it is a way of knowing yourself intimately through um, the body. Well, you mentioned, you made reference to a certain tradition right there. Uh, many of us who are poets also claim Walt Whitman in terms of celebrating the physical, celebrating the body. Do you also draw upon that tradition? Not at all. It's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> well, I don't know if it makes a difference. I, I'm, I'm sure it does that I'm first generation American mm -hmm. and um, Walt Whitman does not feel like He's one of our guys, That's you good know. To see, right. So I think um, <coughs> that my psychic landscape or my actual landscape is more the dark woods of the Brothers Grimm. Hmm. That feels more like where I'm comfortable and at home. And uh, so a lot of um, the tradition that I'm drawing on is is really not American mm -hmm. per se. Well, talk about this tradition. Uh, are there other writers that you could mention that when we look at Barbara Goldberg's work, we say, "Oh, look at so and so because they're doing the same thing I'm doing." Uh, who are your influences out of that tradition? You're talking literary right. influences. Um, well, in this country, I would say um, Charles Simic because he also has that mythic dark woods as the undertone of all his poems and the undertone also of war, terror, um, uh, black humor mm -hmm. that you need to survive in that kind of landscape. And in terms of women poets, I'd point to Louise Glick also because I think um, that she's talking about knowing the world in, in the same kind of terms. I don't know whether influence is the right word, though, um, and, and very many writers from abroad. I, I look at um, South American writers, Cortazar, and of course, Zimborska. And actually, I came to Wisława Zimborska 
because someone recommended her to me because of a poem I'll read mm. at the end, There for the Grace, and apparently she has a book called, an earlier book was There But for the Grace. She's a Polish writer, Nobel laureate. Um, but when I found her work, it was like, yes, this is, this is what I've been doing. Mm. And it was such a sense of homecoming. I think what I admire about her is that she mixes up so many dictions in the same poem. I mean, you can hear in a workshop here in this country, people would say, oh, well, you can't switch tones. Right. You can't be colloquial and elevated in the same piece of work. And that's what I love, is mixing up the different. You seem to take a lot of risks in your poems. Is that something that you, you feel is, is part of your, your work in terms of style? Well, if I don't surprise myself, why am right. I doing this? That's right. the goal. Right. And I don't think of it as risks. I, I think of it as I want to, well, first of all, I have to delight myself. And I have to be curious about how something's going to turn out myself otherwise. Uh, and I don't think when I'm sitting down to write that I'm thinking, oh, well, the audience won't understand this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't. Do you have your audience in mind in terms not of? Not at all. OK. Well, I guess. I guess an audience would be full of millions of little old me's just loving it. <laughs> right. you know? Well, we do love your work, Barbara. <laughs> now, one thing I, I notice when I, I look at um, some of the poems, you draw heavily upon like fairy tales. Yeah. Um, it seems like this storytelling that, that you seem fascinated by. Uh, is that like the little girl in you, or is this something which oh, you I see? Oh, I don't think fairy tales are little. Okay. I mean, I think they embody, to use that word again, profound truths about mm. human nature, and they're they're uh, eternal, these eternal truths about human nature, and that's what draws me to them. The, I mean, the story part is the lure, mm -hmm. but the truths in there are uh, what, what fascinates and what enables people, to children, mm -hmm. to grow. And interestingly enough, this book, Cautionary Tales, is the opposite of a fairy tale. A cautionary tale is a tale of, oh, you mustn't <coughs> go there, or you mustn't do that. Right. That's what your parents always tell you. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> oh, please, oh, watch out. Right. You know, and um, interestingly enough, um, Cautionary Tales is a work by uh, Struvelpeta was my guiding influence, shock-headed Peter. Mm -hmm. um, it's called Pretty Stories, Funny Pictures, and it was written by a, a pediatrician, a sadistic 19th century German pediatrician, all these horrible things that would happen to you. My favorite in there since I was a thumb sucker mm -hmm. was Conrad, little Conrad and the tailor who would come at night with these giant shears and cut your thumb off. This, this is what I grew up <laughs> on. <laughs> right. No, it wasn't Mary Poppins. Did, did some, of these, were some of these stories told you by your, your mother, your father, your grandparents? How did these stories come through? Were they ones that well, you read they on were, your own? They were bought they were in my room. I mean, Struvelpeta with the shock-headed Peter with the hair like this, and he, the little matchstick girl who didn't eat, and so she faded away and died and was buried. Um, these were supposed to be tales of instruction, I guess, and yet I literally ate this up. Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I look at, uh, along with some of these stories, woven into some of the poems, uh, is this sort of dark side. You know, there is a sense of, of sorrow quite a bit in your work. Uh, is that something that you feel that you're working through, or is it just something that you feel um, is part of the vocabulary that, that you work with? Well, now we're talking about grief and sorrow mm -hmm. and disappointment and longing and frustration and all of those good things that I think are in any writer's life, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe more so than most. Um, yes, I, I feel that I work through my grief um, again, I don't, <clears throat> I don't think of poetry or writing as therapy, mm -hmm. but I find I come to understandings that I wouldn't have come to by any other way, including therapy, because it's like, it really is a sense of discovery, a voyage, of journey, and each, po each poem is a journey that I don't know how is going to end, mm -hmm. and that all these choices have to be made. Um, so I do, I, I am fascinated with grief because I guess, um, I guess I just, I just feel it's what shapes me. Well, if and and I, I want to just add one more thing, and that is um, I think there's only, in my real life, when I'm saying my real life, who knows what my real life is, but in my everyday life, 
um, I love to laugh and uh, I can forgive any human sin if the person's funny. Right. <laughs> and I think that laughter is a way to, to fight grief maybe and in the, I have some very funny poems, but I think on the whole um, the sense of grief that is not just mine, by the way. Mm. It's uh, a grief for humanity. Well, let's look at that because, you know, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, the culture that you operate out of. And, and I think that when one looks at, you know, Jewish culture, there are certain incidents that have taken place which has given rise to a certain sensibility, the same way an African-American would draw upon slavery. and uh, Jewish right many times draws upon the Holocaust. Uh, but at the same time, you talk about the importance of laughter and joy. Oh, absolutely. Uh, how do you blend these two? Um, well, part of me wants to fight the question um, because I think the fact that the Holocaust was very present in my home. It's why I was born in this country and everyone else was born, quote, over there. And uh, my family lost people in the Holocaust. My uncle was a survivor. My grandparents died there and all of that. Um, but think of the Holocaust then uh, as a force, an evil force, which destroys, takes things from you. And speaking of fairy tale, I think this is what made me so uncomfortable in Hansel and Gretel, for instance, when they pushed the witch in the oven. Even though the Holocaust was never talked about directly, believe it or not, and everything that I knew was overheard in some way, I knew that I was, that as a child, that there was something awful, horrible, not to be talked about, that had happened. Um, the fact that it happened to Jews, and, and mainly Jews, although of course there were gypsies and homosexuals right. and all the rest, was not, I, I just knew that you had to be really careful because there were dark forces out there. And in terms of slavery and an African American, I think it's the fact of slavery, I mean in a way I, I almost feel like it could happen to anybody by chance it happened to black people. By chance it happened to Jews, but these forces are loose in the world and could happen to anybody. You talk about chance. You have a poem uh, about chance. Could you read that for us? Oh, this is called Miracle of Bubbles. And um, actually this poem, I know I hate to talk about the, you know, what came before the poem, but um, I think that newspaper headlines or st stories that are in the, that in the news grab my attention sometimes. And so this did, the factual news, the story, did happen. The Miracle of Bubbles. A woman drives to the video store to rent a movie. It is Saturday night. She is thinking of nothing in particular, perhaps of how later she will pop popcorn or hold hands with her husband and pretend they are still in high school. On the way home, a plane drops from the sky, the wing shearing the roof of her car, killing her instantly. Here is a death. It could happen to any of us. Her husband will struggle the rest of his days to give shape to an event that does not mean to be understood. Since memory cannot operate without plot, he chooses the romantic how young she was, her lovely waist, or the ironic, if only she had lost her keys, stopped for pizza. At the precise moment the plane spiraled out of control, he was lathering shampoo into his daughter's hair, blonde and fine as corn silk, in love with his life, his daughter, the earth, for corn silk is how he thought of her hair in love with the miracle of bubbles, how they rise in a slow dance, swell and shimmer in the steamy air, then dissolve as though they never were. Thank you. I want to move from your own work uh, into translations. Um, you've been translating a number of poems. Um, could you talk about that, how you approach translation? How I approach translation. Well, translation is a gift for the writer <laughs> because essentially the literal draft of what you're working from 
is like a first draft and it's ugly and it's full of clumsiness. I mean, I'm talking about the literal meaning, the word for word translation of the poem. And um, it's a gift. It's a lousy first draft. And then you bring to bear all your skills as a, as a poet to shape that into, into music. And uh, if you have, well, what is the phrase? If if it's ac if if the bride is no, I mean, if the bride is accurate, she is not faithful, and if she is not faithful, she is not beautiful. I won't correct you if you. No, I, I know because there's <laughs> another one. It's like kissing a bride through a veil. I'm getting all my Victor Hugo's mixed up. But anyway, um, I think uh, it's it's. And actually, I've translated from languages I do know, but m the body of my transl the body I keep hmm. of my translated work is from a language I don't know, which is Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And um, that seems I, there's there's just like no response. Whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to make the literal better. There's no pressure on me. Well, when you when you look at the translation, um, and in some cases you're dealing with with writers that you know. Um, right. How do you balance, you know, dealing with the writer and their demands as well as the audience that you're translating for? Bringing in the audience again, like, who thinks about <laughs> well, that? Well, someone wants um, to read one of these. I mean, that's, we have to think about that well, in terms in of Hebrew, who we write for. Well, in Hebrew, there are many difficulties in translating, and not the least of which are all the biblical allusions and references that are part of Mother's Milk over there and that the American audience does not have at their fingertips when we speak in the, uh, of evil from the north. Everyone in the Middle East is, uh, or, or in Israel is familiar with that biblical phrase, evil coming from the north. If you said evil from the north, I mean, what are Americans going to think? Canada? I mean, it just has no resonance, and that is a difficulty. And so sometimes I write into the, into the translation. If there's maybe in some of the verbs or adjectives that are used elsewhere, I'll now, um, now, if you're working on a translation project, does that interrupt your um, poetry writing? And, or, no. or are you able to switch back and forth? Yeah, I can switch back and forth. Um, and sometimes they each inspire. I mean, the translations have inspired. Um, the work that I've been translating is so different from my own voice. Um, I've been translating the Israeli writer Moshe Dor a lot. Mm -hmm. And in our new anthology, after the first rain, there are like 61 Israeli writers, and I've translated quite a lot of them. Let's talk about uh, you know Israeli writers because you've stayed abreast of contemporary Israeli um, literature. Uh, what are some of the themes that we find when we examine this body of work? It's very different from American work, and um, it's written from the sense of living on the edge that there really may be no tomorrow, from being under constant threat. Actually, it fits in quite well with my worldview. <laughs> and um, chance and things like that. And chance and comets, you know, right. and things. And so there's an intensity and a, um, the, the, the themes are different. A lot of themes on war and peace and loss. What about for women writers who are women uh, Israeli writers? Well, women Israeli writers are, are taken with this. I mean, it's not that, that there are no love poems right. or anything like that, but they're all tinged with, the, with a sense of the precariousness of everything because there may be no tomorrow. And women writers, of course, write about loss of children or, um, or husbands or lovers, and it, it, it interrupts. I mean, the situation, as it's called, yeah. the situation, it interrupts daily life so much that it is part of daily life. And I, I find very little in Israeli poetry of what I find a lot of here. It's not that people are sitting down and trying to make something pretty. Mm -hmm. You know, they're writing out of a different sense of need, a, 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 a urgency that um, I find that uh, that so attracts me. Do you find, in terms of your own life, any things that you see the same urgency that here in this country that you wish to give voice to? Oh, um, I'm not sure that um, I think that sense of urgency uh, it maybe comes out, but it, but translated in a poem, I feel a tremendous sense of urgency um, and a tremendous sense of impending loss because. I'm missing. Uh, I'm missing voices in the public arena. Um, that are voices that that uh, seem to be on target, 
defining the problem, the situation here. And I think there are just so many red herrings out there. I could scream, and people are falling for <laughs> the, the red herrings rather than the real issues. I, I think we're in tremendous danger. I mean, and democracy is in tremendous danger as we feel you know, that government is remote, and uh, so we don't vote, because who cares, and it doesn't make a difference anyway. I, I, yeah, I do. Well, talking about our government, uh, you were uh, fortunate um, to receive two NEA fellowships. Um, over the last few years, we, we know that the endowment has been targeted. Uh, many people have been participating in the debate about whether we should fund the arts. If you look back at your career, and you look at these NEA fellowships that you received, did it make a difference in Barbara Goldberg's you know, life? I can't tell you how much of a difference it made. It's like, well, this sounds shallow, <laughs> the good housekeeping seal of approval or whatever, but it, it so much in the poetry life as in any other life has to do with you know, who you know and all this kind of thing. I, I, I really felt that the NEA was a pure award or, or grant that um, I didn't know people on the panel. And if they found something uh, worthy in my poetry, it made me feel um, tremendously validated. Maybe I shouldn't be so shallow. <laughs> Maybe I should have that inner validation all on my own. But you know, right. it came at, um, I, I've had two. And they've come at very different times. And they've both been incredibly meaningful. And in many ways, uh, I think I'm a persistent, stubborn person, but this made me more persistent and more stubborn and more able to roll with the punches of everyday life. Hmm. When, we, so. when we look at where, where you are in your work, we look at Cautionary Tale, Marvelous Pursuits, and I know you're working on a, a new manuscript, which is tenderly titled Thirst. Um, we're changing we're that. Changing that right? <laughs> in the car, we changed okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, how difficult is it for you at this point still um, to find a publisher? Well, it's like each one is starting, starting anew. It's kind of maddening. Um, I, I, I don't, it's, it's not like in the days where a publisher said, OK, let's have first look. Like, who cares? <laughs> and um, it's starting all over again. It's, very, it's tremendously discouraging. Cautionary Tales took over 10 years to, find, um, to finally make it through to a prize. Marvelous Pursuits, but it was just luck. It was in two years, but that was luck. Right. You know, again, who's who's the best reader of your work? It's been interesting. But we take you, Barbara Gober, into the classroom now, and 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 you're looking at at, at another generation of writers. Mm -hmm. What do you tell them in terms of um, you know publications, outlets, things of that sort? Um, what does the future look like for for the for them? Well, uh, it just means that if you write for the love of it, and that's reason enough to do it because it gives you some deep satisfaction. It's not reason enough, though, frankly. Um, I think I've led the last 20 years of my life um, in the public arena. And it is discouraging, and you just better get tough. If you look at um, where you are in terms of uh, Maryland, Washington, Virginia area, uh, what type of literary community is this that, you, that you've spent so much time being part of? Has it been one that has been um, nourishing? Have you wished they would have been maybe more supportive? Um, are the bookstores close to your house that you would like them to be? When we look at this here, you know, how do you see yourself fitting into this literary community? And how has it treated Barbara Goldberg? The literary community. So you're talking about that in the broadest sense. Right. Um, obviously. If you hang out with people, some of them become your nearest and dearest friends, which has become true. Some of them become your nearest and dearest enemies. <laughs> well, they're not enemies, just people you don't want to spend time right. with. Um, I guess I've been extremely fortunate in terms of the literary community further there. I mean, I've gotten grants, and Maryland has been very good to me. I've gotten a number of artist fellowships from Maryland. As a matter of fact, my very first grant was from Maryland, a work in progress grant. So that world's been good to me. And I figure that my work is done when I've written the poem. And after that, you know, in terms of marketing mm. or showcasing and all of that, I, I surely do love it when things drop in my lap. Well, we can, drop in, <laughs> we can showcase one of your new poems. I think you have a poem from the new collection that you're working on. Ah. Something's in there. Yes. OK, we can perhaps close with this poem. I do work in the work world. 
I, I'm a speech writer. That's how I earn my daily bread. And sometimes I learn about very interesting things. In this case, it was Blanding's turtles, which um, their bodies don't deteriorate after the, after the equivalent of a 22-year-old. Uh, so that's where the Blanding's turtles come in. They have fabulous immune systems, far flung. Honeybees and frogs are fast disappearing. What will become of little green apples, the loneliness of lily pads? Some species of moths no longer pollinate our zone in yuccas. Askance, askew, something is amiss. A tsunami 100 feet high washes away 3,000 souls in Papua New Guinea. It's hard to know when disasters are natural. Once I was stung by a bee and my arm swelled like a melon. In college, a date slipped a frog down my blouse and I couldn't stop screaming those frantic hind legs. In high school, I pithed a toad. Later, I saw a half-carved cadaver, head and feet wrapped in soap cloth, the yellow jelly we call fat. The leaner they are, the tougher to cut. Blanding's turtles don't deteriorate with age. Our brain is the size of two clenched fists. The hand is the most complicated of organs, which, as is written on a card I carry in my wallet, I will donate to others, eyes, liver, lungs, heart, whatever can be salvaged, should all else fail. Okay. Another disaster. <laughs> no, but it's been wonderful. Uh, if this has been a disaster, it's been the Titanic we've been together. Uh, I want to thank you for being my guest on The Writing Live. It's always good to see you. And I hope that the new book will be a success as the other two. Thank Barbara you. Gover, thank you. Uh, my name has been E. Ethelbert Miller. This has been The Writing Life. My guest today has been Barbara Gober. <laughs>